and welcome back to another episode of Courts This Week, your go-to source for the latest legal updates presented by Live Law. I'm your host, Ostika Das, and I'm here to take you through the most significant updates from this week. From the corridors of the Supreme Court to local judicial proceedings, I'll be providing you with clear and concise summaries that keep you informed and ahead of the curve. Remember, for a more in-depth understanding, do visit our website at www.livelaw.in. In today's episode, we cover the NEAT UG 2024 controversy, the Bhoj Shala Kamal Mosque Rao, plea seeking and investigation into Mukhtar Ansari's death in custody and much more. So let's dive into the headlines. In a significant decision this week, the Supreme Court of India directed the National Testing Agency to publish the NEAT UG 2024 results on a city-wise and centre-wise basis on their official website, ensuring that the identities of the students remain masked. This decision was the result of a batch of petitions that called for the cancellation of the NEAT UG 2024 exam, citing allegations of paper leaks and widespread malpractices. The bench, headed by Chief Justice of India, D.Y. Chandrachur, emphasized the necessity for transparency in the examination process. They instructed the NTA to complete the exercise by noon on Saturday, allowing for a thorough review of the data. The Solicitor General opposed the move, arguing that it was unprecedented and unnecessary. However, the court insisted on the importance of dissecting the complete data to ascertain the extent of the alleged leak and enable a fair assessment of the center-wise marking patterns. As per the Supreme Court's order, the results have now been released on NTA's website. This week, the Supreme Court dismissed a plea filed by two convicts in the high-profile Bilkis Banu case, which challenged the January judgment that had set aside their remission granted by the Gujarat government. The bench comprising Justices Sanjeev Khanna and Sanjay Kumar asserted that it could not sit in appeal over a judgment rendered by a coordinate bench. In this landmark judgment, a bench of Justices B.V. Nagaratna and Ujjal Bhuya had held that the Gujarat government was not the competent authority to grant remission to the 11 convicts in the Bilkis Banu case as the trial had been conducted in Maharashtra. Consequently, the convicts who were prematurely released in August 2022 were directed to surrender. Challenging this January 8 judgment, the present plea was filed by convicts Radhesham Bhagwanda Shah and Raju Bhai Babulal Soni. The petitioners also sought relief of bail. Shah and Soni, as well as the other convicts, were sentenced to life imprisonment for multiple murders and gang rapes against the backdrop of the 2002 communal riots in Gujarat. One of their victims was Bilkis Banu, who was 21 years old and five months pregnant when she was gang raped by them during the 2002 communal riots. Bilkis Banu approached the Supreme Court in a writ petition challenging the premature release of the 11 convicts. Other public interest litigations were also filed against the premature release of these 11 convicts. In a significant development in the Adani Hindenburg matter, the Supreme Court this week dismissed a petition that sought a review of its January verdict, which had rejected a plea for a court-monitored investigation into allegations against the Adani group. The bench, including Chief Justice D.Y. Chandrachur, maintained that there was no error apparent on the face of the record to warrant a review of that decision. The court emphasized that the Securities and Exchange Board of India was already conducting a comprehensive investigation into the allegations and there was no ground to doubt the regulatory body's process. This case stems from allegations made by Hindenburg Research in January 2023, accusing the Adani group of various financial malpractices which the conglomerate has vehemently denied. This week, the Supreme Court heard serious allegations from Umar Ansari, son of late Mukhtar Ansari, claiming that his father was poisoned while in jail and denied necessary medical treatment, ultimately leading to his death. The bench comprising Justices Rishikesh Roy and SVN Bharti issued notice seeking a response from the state of Uttar Pradesh to an application for amending a writ petition that had been previously filed with a prayer for protection for Mukhtar Ansari in custody. The Supreme Court had issued protective orders in this writ petition. After Mukhtar Ansari passed away in jail on 28th March, his youngest son, Umar, has moved this application to amend the prayers of the original writ petition. The amended prayers seek the registration of an FIR for the alleged murder of the petitioner's father and the constitution of a special investigation team to investigate the cause of death. During this week's hearing, senior advocate Kapil Sibal, representing Umar, highlighted the urgency and gravity of the situation emphasizing the need for a thorough inquiry into the circumstances surrounding Mukhtar Ansari's death. The state of Uttar Pradesh, however, opposed the application seeking to amend the original writ petition. Accordingly, the bench allowed the state time to file its written response to this latest application. 
This week, the Supreme Court dismissed a petition by Karnataka Deputy Chief Minister D.K. Shiva Kumar challenging a High Court order that had refused to quash a disproportionate assets case against him. Senior Advocate Mukul Rohadki, appearing for Shiva Kumar, submitted that the investigation had commenced without obtaining prior sanction under Section 17A of the Prevention of Corruption Act, pointing out that the question of whether Section 17A would apply to offences allegedly committed before the 2018 amendment through which this section was inserted in the legislation has been referred to a larger bench in the Chandra Babu Naidu case. However, the bench comprising Justices Bela M. Trivedi and Satish Chandra Sharma held that the proceedings could not be quashed based on a split verdict regarding the applicability of Section 17A of the Prevention of Corruption Act and proceeded to dismiss the case. This week, the Maharashtra government informed the Supreme Court that a 4.39 acre land parcel in Bandra Kulla will be handed over by September 10th for the construction of a new Bombay High Court building. The special bench led by Chief Justice D.Y. Chandrachur has been closely monitoring this project and had previously urged the government to expedite the process in a suo motor petition regarding the heritage building of the Bombay High Court and the issue of additional land allotment. The court emphasized the need for a modern judicial infrastructure to meet the growing demands of the legal system in Mumbai. The new building is expected to address the space constraints and improve the working conditions for judges, lawyers and litigants. The Supreme Court will continue reviewing the progress of the project in August. At the same time, the special bench recorded in its order that the Chief Justice of the Bombay High Court will be at liberty to convene meetings and ensure that due monitoring of the project is being carried out continuously. In a notable development, retired Justice L. Narasimha Reddy has stepped down as the head of the Commission of Inquiry into alleged power procurement irregularities during K. Chandrasekhar Rao's tenure as Chief Minister of Telangana. This decision came after the Supreme Court expressed concerns over Justice Reddy's press statements. During her hearing this week, Chief Justice of India D.Y. Chandrachur, alongside Justices J.B. Pardiwala and Manod Mishra indicated that Justice Reddy's comments might imply pre-judgment of the case. The Supreme Court was hearing a petition filed by Rao challenging the notification issued by the new Congress-led government in March this year constituting the Commission. He approached the Supreme Court after the Telangana High Court dismissed his challenge on 2nd July. Senior Advocate Mukul Rohadki representing Rao criticised the inquiry as politically motivated. During the hearing, the CJI stressed the need for procedural fairness and the perception of impartiality in judicial inquiries. Senior Advocate Dr. Abhishek Manu Singhvi, representing the state, was given time to consult and upon resumption of the hearing, Senior Advocate Gopal Shankaranarayanan announced that Justice Reddy had decided to resign from his post as the Inquiry Commission's Chief. This week, the Supreme Court demanded responses from three states in five union territories regarding their compliance with the 2014 Nalsa v. Union of India judgment, which mandates affirmative action for the transgender community. The contempt petition filed by members of the transgender community highlighted the lack of effective reservation policies affecting their educational and employment opportunities. The court directed states and UTs including Sikkim, Rajasthan, Telangana, Chandigarh, Delhi, Lakshadweep, Dadra and Nagar Haveli and Ladakh to submit their compliance reports by 31st August 2024. The Supreme Court's 2014 NALSA ruling recognized transgender persons as a third gender and called for their treatment as socially and educationally backward classes. Despite some progress, many regions have yet to formulate effective policies. This case will be revisited on 6 September 2024, with the court emphasizing the importance of implementing reservations and welfare schemes to support the transgender community. In a key update, Justices N. Koteshwar Singh and R. Mahadevan were sworn in as Supreme Court judges this Thursday, bringing the court to its full strength of 34 judges. Chief Justice of India D.Y. Chandrachur administered the oaths. Justice Singh, previously Chief Justice of Jammu and Kashmir and Ladakh High Courts, is the first Supreme Court judge from Manipur. He has had a distinguished career including stints at the Gohati and Manipur High Courts. Justice Mahadevan, formerly acting Chief Justice of the Madras High Court, brings extensive experience in civil, criminal and tax law. He was elevated to the Madras High Court in 2013 and has handled over 9,000 cases. Their appointments fill the vacancies left by Justices Aniruddha Bose and A.S. Bopanna. The Archaeological Survey of India has delivered its survey report to the Madhya Pradesh High Court, concluding that the Kamal Mala Mosque was constructed using parts from earlier temples. In its report, the ASI has said that based on scientific and archaeological findings, the reused temple components date back to the Paramara dynasty period. It has further submitted that many temple carvings, including deities and mythical figures, were mutilated to fit the mosque's construction. This report has reignited the historical and cultural debate surrounding the Bhotshala complex, which is claimed by both Hindus who view it as a temple 
and Muslims who consider it a mosque. In related news, the Supreme Court is also set to hear a plea challenging the Madhya Pradesh High Court's order for the ASI survey, highlighting ongoing tensions over the site's religious and historical significance. West Bengal Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee has filed an appeal with the Calcutta High Court challenging an order that restrains her from making defamatory statements about Governor C.V. Ananda Bose. The interim injunction issued by Justice Krishna Rao on 15 July also applies to two members of the West Bengal State Legislative Assembly and a TMC leader. This injunction was prompted by statements made by Banerjee alleging that women felt unsafe entering the Raj Bhavan due to recent sexual harassment claims against the governor. The court emphasized that while freedom of speech is protected, it does not extend to defamatory remarks meant to harm reputations. Justice Rao's order aims to prevent further damage to the governor's reputation and restricts defamatory statements until 14th of August. The West Bengal Chief Minister has moved the Calcutta High Court against this order. In a significant political move this week, Justice Rohit Arya, who retired from the Madhya Pradesh High Court on 27th April, has joined the Bharatiya Janata Party. In an exclusive interview with Live Law, Justice Arya explained that his decision to align with the BJP is rooted in a shared philosophy centered on human values and social justice. He emphasized that his aim is to continue his efforts to support marginalized communities, stating that he views the BJP as a platform to help realize his vision for justice and inclusivity. Justice Arya clarified that despite his new political affiliation, he has no intention of pursuing electoral politics. Instead, he plans to contribute to public life by advising the BJP on various issues. He also voiced support for the recently introduced criminal laws including the Bhartya Naya Sanhita, Bhartya Nagarik Suraksha Sanhita and Bhartya Saksha Adhinyam, praising them for incorporating ancient justice principles. He also spoke about his past judicial decisions such as denying bail to stand-up comedian Munawar Farooqi and his controversial order involving a bail condition that mandated an accused to have a rakhi tied by the woman whose modesty he allegedly outraged. This controversial rakhi tying order was later criticized and set aside by the Supreme Court. However, during his interview, Justice Arya defended his actions as aimed at achieving social harmony and resolving disputes amicably. He also remarked that post-retirement judges should be free to express their personal views without compromising their impartiality during their judicial tenure. You can read the entire interview on www.livelaw.in. The West Bengal government has established a seven-member committee tasked with reviewing the recently enacted criminal laws. This committee is responsible for evaluating whether state-specific amendments are necessary and if the statute's names should be adjusted for local relevance. The committee comprises distinguished members including retired Justice Ashim Kumar Roy, the Advocate General of West Bengal and senior officials from various departments. Their mandate includes examining the implications of the new laws on the state level and suggesting modifications that could better serve West Bengal's needs. The resolution passed on 16 July invokes Article 246 2 of the Constitution, which empowers state legislators to enact laws on matters in the concurrent list, including criminal law and procedure. The committee has been given three months to submit its findings, during which it will engage with academic and legal experts, conduct public consultations and seek diverse opinions. The Lokpal of India has dismissed a complaint seeking an investigation into Prime Minister Narendra Modi's allegations that industrialists Adani and Ambani were funding the Congress party with black money. The anti-corruption body led by former Supreme Court Justice A.M. Khanvilkar labelled the Prime Minister's statements as mere election propaganda based on conjectural facts rather than verifiable evidence. The complaint filed in response to a speech made during the Telangana election campaign was deemed to lack substantive allegations of corruption. The Lokpal's order stated that the speech constituted a series of hypothetical questions rather than concrete claims of wrongdoings. The body also noted that the speech did not indicate that the Prime Minister possessed any actionable intelligence related to the accusations. Consequently, the Lokpal concluded that there were no grounds for further investigation into the Prime Minister's allegations. And that is a wrap for this week's Legal News Roundup. Before we bid adieu, the entire Live Law team has a small request for our dedicated viewers. As an independent and fact-driven media organization, we are deeply committed to fearless and ethical journalism. To continue bringing you the latest legal updates, especially in this dynamic audiovisual format, we rely on your support. So here's how you can help. Give our video a thumbs up if you found it informative. Share it with your family, friends, classmates and colleagues. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel for more insightful content. Drop your valuable thoughts and feedback in the comments below and hit that bell icon to stay updated with our latest releases. 
Don't forget to visit our website at www.livelaw.in for our in-depth reports and analysis. Not only this, but the Live Law channel offers memberships for only Rs 89 per month. Become a part of LL supporters today to access exclusive perks such as loyalty badges next to your name in comments and live chat, priority to reply to comments and for our student pass audience, early access to explainers and legal updates. I'm your host, Ostika Das, and it's been a pleasure bringing you this week's Legal News Roundup. Until next time, stay informed and stay engaged and stay tuned to Live Law. Thank you for watching.